I just want to address something because, you know, things pop up in the world and in, in our lives and such, and we need some answers just to make sure that everybody has a right perspective, okay? One of the worst things is to see believers who have access to the truth still be loose in the way that they see things, perceive things, etc. And that even includes our worldview of things. So we've done this in the past. We have a whole series called God and Government uh, where we try to help people get a biblical worldview of all things related to politics and society and peoples and the way things ought to be and what's, what's the best kind of government, all that kind of stuff. We can find from the Word of God, so we've spent some time on that, but we don't spend too much time on that. We preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, which doesn't include that a whole bunch. But it does include a little bit, so you'll have insight and perspective in how things are to be today, uh, rightly dividing or rightly interpreting the Scriptures for your own personal life, for your own personal beliefs, so that the way that you live your life, the way that you vote, the way that you think, the way that you approach people has a biblical anchor point or plumb line. You are, you are stuck to the Word of God in the way that you believe, the way you vote, the way you act, the way you talk. And all the things you do. Amen? Amen? Doesn't that make sense? That if there's a truth and a best way, don't you want that way? Yes. And so we've spent some time on that. Now some pulpits or some churches will, you know, it seems like every time you come to church they're addressing some cultural thing that's happening. Some society problem. Uh, some, you know, some atrocity in, in, the, in the land that's happened or something they heard on the TV. And we very rarely ever do that. Okay. Now, we did do uh, some teaching on the uh, LGBT or homosexuality issue in the, in, the, in the recent past. We've talked a little bit about politics here and there, not too much. Uh, but I do want to address today the idea of world terrorism just for a moment so that you know where the church stands, where the Christian stands, what is our, uh, what is our obligation, what is our responsibility, what is our authority when it comes to war, when it comes to police, when it comes to carrying a gun, when it comes to defending people, when it comes to defending the country, when it comes to things like that. Does anybody want to hear a, a few things about that? Yeah. Okay. There, there's a little bit of conflict if you don't understand the Scriptures. It's like, well, I don't know where I'm supposed to stand on this. Uh, so I want to talk about it. Because sometimes people get into the fact that Christians are to be pacifists. Like, because we're Christians, we don't ever fight anything at all. And do nothing while we get destroyed. Uh, but that's not necessarily what Jesus was teaching. We'll read the scripture where he said, turn the other cheek type scripture. You know, you, you remember the turn the other cheek. It's like, well, why don't we just turn the other cheek uh, to the terrorist? Well, here's what you have to know first of all. The scriptures, particularly the New Testament, is instruction for believers only. Amen. New Testament is instruction for believers only. The New Testament was not given to govern nations. Amen. The Old Testament was given to govern one nation. The New Testament was not given to govern any nation or any government. Interesting, isn't it? Now, we've done a lot of teaching to explain this and prove that out, but just remember that. The New Testament is given, the instructional part of the New Testament is given to believers. Now, part of that... New Testament is given to sinners to get them saved and in, and then we give them the instructions. Amen. So how to live is given to the Christian. How to get saved is given to the sinner. And until they're saved, they can't do any of the instruction anyway right. from their heart. Right. So God's after the heart. He's after writing His laws in the heart. He's not after giving a list of laws to the unsaved. He tried that in the Old Testament. He knew it wouldn't work, but He had to show that it wouldn't work. The entire Old Testament is, is, was delivered to show that man cannot keep the laws. The blessing of the whole idea was that he's going to make a new covenant and put the laws in our hearts. Amen. Yeah. But you can't follow those laws unless your heart's open to Jesus and then he can put his spirit in, take the stony heart out. So the New Testament instruction applies to believers only. Amen. Did y'all know that? I dare to say most of you, or many of you, did not know that. Now you know that. 
And that's why we don't take the New Testament instructions to non-believers saying you can't do this and you can't do that and you shouldn't do this. What we do is we take the New Testament gospel of Jesus crucified, resurrected, and, the, and ascended, and Holy Spirit descended. We take that message to the sinner and say, do you want Jesus in your life? And if you don't, do whatever you want to do. If you don't want Jesus in your life, you can go live however you want to. Amen. Amen. You realize that that's how the gospel's written? Yeah. Amen. You can go do all your evil stuff. You can get judged on judgment day. If you don't want Jesus, your blood's on your own head. I'm not here to force all the unsaved people to live right. Amen. Interesting, isn't it? Amen. But we are here to help the church walk with Jesus and live right. So just remember that. Now, watch Romans chapter 13, verse 1. It says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you'll have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister. Not talking about preachers or pastors. An avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. Then he goes on and talks about, For because of this you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers, attending continually to this very thing. Stop there. What is this context all about? This is explaining how authorities, whether it be government, whether it be police, whether it be federal, state, world, local, city, police, or security guard. Those authority positions or positions of authority have been given by God to keep order in a place to keep peace in a society, to protect the innocent. And here it says very specifically, to punish the evildoers, to execute wrath on him who practices evil. We've had this question on our website before. It was a policeman who said, is it okay for me to carry a gun being a Christian? It's a good question. And so we presented, I typed a whole answer out. I think the answer is on, a, on our already answered questions page. But the entire answer is to help him recognize, sure, you can carry a pistol. Sure, you can carry a pistol. Remember the command in the Old Testament, thou shalt not kill? Is that like a one sentence that covers everything? No, 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 not at all. Remember, that was a command in the Old Testament, but also remember that God told Israel, kill all the unrighteous of the land and take over. How can he say not kill and then say kill? Because what he was saying was not... Uh, the judgment against unrighteous, and it was not against defending your own selves. It was simply murder. Don't take another man's life unjustly. Isn't that right? Yeah. That's why he, that's part of the law was, hey, if so-and-so has killed so-and-so, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, that person can be killed. Matter of fact, kill him immediately. Kill him the same day, and if that day's the Sabbath, kill him the next day. So it's not that God is against all killing. Okay? Now, recognize this. He hates death. God hates death. The Bible says that. He hates death. Death is an enemy to God. He hates it as much as we do and more than we do. He hates the fact that sin ever came in in the first place and that death ever came in in the first place. And He hates killing. In the Old Testament, he, he allowed it and commanded swift justice and even sometimes killing. And it was quite scary because the justice system requires killing. And since God is the judge, His system required killing. Now with the cross, things have changed. With the cross, remember the angels? We're going to remember this, of course, at Christmas time because you're going to sing these songs and see these plays. <laughs> And at every Christmas play and every Christmas song, what is that? That the angels are, 
are singing. What, what are they singing when Jesus is born? Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. That was the, when Jesus was born, that was the moment when God... I don't have to kill the unjust anymore. I can, I can relieve myself from punishing sins immediately. Jesus is the mediator between God and man. When Jesus came, peace came to the earth, goodwill came to the earth, and the hand of judgment has been paused. There is a judgment day, and there will be punishment of all evildoers, and there will be death coming from God. But right now, the blood of Jesus has given us a time to repent. The blood of Jesus has covered every Christian and given every sinner a time to repent and believe in Jesus. So mercy has now taken front seat. Just judgment or punishment has taken back seat. And we're in a different era than we were in the Old Testament. And that's why God does not tell Christians, kill all your enemies. You understand? Yeah. But this passage right here is not talking to Christians in your personal life. He's talking about the powers that be in city, state, and any, any form of governments have been ordained by God to keep people safe and to punish evildoers and to protect the innocent. And that's where we find military is okay. All right? Amen. Police is okay. We need it because there's evildoers out there. Executing wrath on him who practices evil. Notice this passage again here. It says, no authority, verse 1, there's no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. It doesn't mean that God approves of everyone that's in that office. Is that okay? It means that that position has been ordained by God. Verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. If an authority is on your case, it's because you did something. People think, oh, well, I don't deserve this. Look, if an authority is on your case, you've done something wrong. Amen. If an authority has come to you and commanded you something, you better do it. And if you're innocent, it will be proven and you can be okay. But you had better obey the authorities. They have been given authority by God to execute wrath and to stand in a place of stopping evil. Amen. I remember when I was in college one time, an officer said, Stop to me and my friend, freeze, hit the ground. Guess what we did? <laughs> we stopped, we froze, we hit the ground. We respected authority. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Then do what is good. <laughs> Y'all are thinking, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? <laughs> Maybe nothing. Maybe nothing. Maybe nothing. Does he have a record? Now you're wondering, do I have a record? Oh, come on. I was a good sinner way back then. <laughs> if you turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's make sure this word is confirmed. You know, every word ought to be confirmed by two or three witnesses. Amen. You know, you can't just take one sentence or three words or even a paragraph. You've got to find it corroborated in Scripture because the rule is what? The rule is that all Scripture must be interpreted by other Scripture. All Scripture must be read in light of all other Scripture. 
So you can't pick and choose favorites and create little doctrines and little causes and little platforms for yourself unless it's corroborated through the rest of the Scriptures. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 says, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. Stop there. Just wanted you to see it once again. Is everybody okay with this? Yes. Alright, so therefore... Um, now, okay, before I do the therefore, let's go to Matthew 5. <clears throat> of course, you remember 2 Timothy chapter 3. Jesus, uh, the Scripture says, All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Remember that? All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So have you suffered persecution? Everybody raise your hand if you've suffered some form of persecution. Okay, raise your hand if you've been killed for your faith. <laughs> raise your hand if you've been beaten for your faith. You may be embarrassed, I understand. Most people not uh, beaten for their faith. But raise your hand if you've been made fun of for your Christianity. Everybody look around. Hallelujah! No, no, when I do that, you're supposed to do that. <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah. He's the weirdest pastor ever. No. No. Uh, Jesus said to do that, didn't he? What did he say to do? Rejoice. Rejoice when you're persecuted, isn't that right? Yep. Matthew chapter 5, where did he say that here? Matthew chapter 5, verse 12. 12. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Hallelujah. Or verse 11. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So rejoice and be exceeding glad. How many of you are exceeding glad to be made fun of? Woo! Go ahead. Woo! Yeah, yeah, you are. 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 Exceeding glad. I'm exceedingly glad. Make fun of me all you want to. Glory to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Laugh with them. Glory to God. You're right, man. I am kind of kooky. Hoo -hoo. <laughs> Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Exceeding glad. It's one of the things that make us Christians different. We just, we can take this kind of stuff. We know this is a supernatural gospel. This is not just making fun of my, my big nose or something. This is very spiritual. They're making fun of Jesus. They don't like Jesus. They probably would like me if they knew me. They would definitely like Jesus if they knew Him. This is all demonic. It's all driven by Satan because he hates Jesus and he stirs up every unsaved person in different ways. And part of that's persecution. Man, y'all are a tough crowd. I can feel some of you still hadn't bought into this. Come on, this is Jesus. Jesus said it. They're going to persecute you. You can't get away from it. You are not here to have the whole world like you. We are not here to cause all of America to like Christians and accept Christians. I expect them to not accept us. Not because we're giving them rules they can't follow. We already know they can't follow the rules. But because we're talking about Jesus a bit too much. We're trying to help people. We're challenging people's heathenism a bit too much. And that's why. Not because we're trying to force them and we're t doing picket picket walks and all that kind of garbage. That's annoying. <laughs> That's not how the gospel was ever preached. There's no pattern for picketing in the gospel. That's not how the gospel is preached. Alright. Now you have more firewood. Burn your picket signs. <laughs> All right, where did I want to go here? Uh, chapter 5 here, verse 40-something. Uh, 40 43, yeah. 543, you've heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for He makes His Son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? 
And if you greet your brethren only, what do, uh, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Poor tax collectors. <laughs> Therefore you shall be perfect as, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now what does this mean here? Uh, remember the other scripture that says if, if somebody smite you on the, smite you on the cheek, cheek turn your, on the right cheek, turn your face, let him hit you on the other cheek. Remember that? And so how does this correspond to this old punishment of evildoers thing? Well, they're completely separate. They're completely separate. This passage right here is not given to countries. This passage here is not given to the authorities that are here to punish evildoers. This passage right here is not given to policemen. It's given to Christians. So in your individual, daily, personal life, this is how you live. You don't retaliate. Our, our life is different. We don't retaliate against those who've wronged us. Amen. Good. Make sense? Yes. Now, turning the other cheek doesn't mean you, you sit there and get beat up. Jesus was punched in the, in the face one time, and he didn't turn the, he was hitting the cheek, he didn't turn the other cheek and say, hit me over here. He's the one that said this, and he didn't do it. Because that's not what he meant. He got hit in the face, and he said, why'd you hit me? Paul got hit in the face. Paul was commanded in Acts chapter 23 to be hit in the face. Maybe we should hold your finger here just in case and go to Acts 23. I just want you to see it. Now let's get some example here. I would say that primarily the turn the other cheek is symbolic. It's really, it's really just the way you respond to people. Because getting hit, getting hit usually has a confrontation that leads up to getting hit. Doesn't it? So he's not saying, you know, backbite with your tongue and then when they finally hit you, let them hit you again. No, he's saying symbolically the, 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 eye, or the parable of getting slapped on the cheek uh, and, and not retaliating means don't backbite. Don't, don't fight with people verbally. Now, some people, you know, we have to deal with children. What, what do we teach our children in the schools? Some bully bullies the child, and what do you tell the child? Go ahead and just get beat up. You know, Jesus said you've got to get beat up. No. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But how can we say absolutely not? It doesn't make any sense in your heart, does it? To get beat up by a bully for no reason. Now, if you were getting punched because you're a Christian, I say take it. If the government's persecuting you because you're a Christian, I say take it. Jesus took it. Paul took it. Peter took it. They got beaten all sorts of ways because of their faith. Amen. But that's not usually why bullies are bullying. Amen. So if it was my child, I've already planned this. I don't have children. But even long before I, I didn't have children, I planned on having children and I planned on how to train them as well. I would train them how to, how to get away from the fight. I'd train them how to actually... The first step in training children is train them how to love. Train them how to care. Train them how to have mercy. The evil bully who's bad-mouthing everybody is hurt. They're sinning. They're, they're, they're just messed up. Therefore, you can have mercy on a messed up person, couldn't you? And be real nice. Love your enemy. Bless them when they curse you. See, this is how you handle long before there's any hitting on the cheek. Bless your enemy, love your enemy, bless those that curse you, do good to those evil people. All those in your life who you consider enemies of any sort, love them, bless them, pray for them, do extra good to them. I'm talking about give them cupcakes, and money, and love, and blessing, and say good things, and compliment, and befriend them. Amen. It's getting quiet up here in the front row. <laughs> This is, this is personal instruction to people who follow Jesus concerning all the things you are responsible for. This passage of love your enemy is not talking about terrorism. Terrorists are not your personal enemy. Terrorists are an enemy to the world. Evil criminals are an enemy to the innocent world around us. This is not, that's not how you treat terrorists. Terrorists need to be popped off one after the other. Yeah. 
Yeah, they're killing people that might have a chance to get saved. They're killing innocent people that, that are getting the chance to hear the gospel and get saved and walk with God snuffed right out. Jesus said, those who would harm an innocent one or keep an innocent one from me, it'd be better if a millstone was hung around his neck and him cast into the sea than to offend a little one or kill a little one. Jesus gets real strict when innocent people are getting killed or hurt. Amen. So that's a good lesson for children at school that you, do, you can step in. If anybody here decided to, to pounce on my wife, guess what? You better hope you can fight better than me. <laughs> you will find the wrath of Chaz. You start, <laughs> you start messing with my wife. I don't care how many times you hit me on the cheek, I'm going to hit yours back. <laughs> See? There's, there's got to be a difference, right? It only makes sense. <laughs> now, if you're mad that she's a Christian, and you're mad at the, the way God is in her in some way, I'll have to let you beat her up. <laughs> She get reward in heaven. I don't want to stop her reward. <laughs> now knowing the difference might be a little tricky. But some maniac, some devil possessed maniac doesn't get to run around killing people in, the, in you know, even in the name of their, their false god or something like that. Okay? So we're talking about maniacs trying to take over the world. When we talk about this this type of terrorism that we know is prevalent right now, we're talking about maniacs possessed by the devil trying to take over the world with force. Really, really, it's all personally, it's, or, or the, the personal feelings is, is really jealousy against the Western world. It's not about Christianity. And persecuting America is not the same as persecuting the church. Even if they do it in the name of religion, it's not really against Christianity. It's against America, which is different than the church, which is not covered in Scripture here. So they're just world terrorists that need to be stopped and put an end to. Amen. I remember a, a statement by Smith Wigglesworth. Now, Wigglesworth ministered before it was popular to do this whole nationalism preaching where it's all about America and all that. He, he lived before that. Um, before Israel was even a nation, really. And this is what he said about World War II. Some people were concerned that he, wasn't care he didn't care about the newspaper and all the details about what was going on in World War II. And they said, how come you don't you know, read a newspaper? And he said, he said, well, he said, that thing's full of lies anyway. He said, I feel a lot cleaner. Uh, he said, if I read that, I'm a lot dirtier when I come out than when I went in. He said, and I like feeling clean. He said, besides, Hitler and Mussolini will soon be in hell where they belong. That was his response to the evil. There's no need to pray for Hitler. I mean, you can if you want to. There's really no need to pray for the evil terrorists. I know Hitler's gone. No need to pray for the evil terrorists. That's not the way that we're handling this. The, they'll be handled by the authorities that be. Let's have mercy on all the people under them. All the people being affected by them. Let's, let's put our prayer on that. I know that's not in Scripture. You can take it for how you want it. All right. Acts chapter 23. Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. And then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. <laughs> He didn't get all pansy. Oh, yeah, hit, hit my other cheek, too. It'd be just fine. Hit my other cheek. So we're not talking about being weird, soft pacifists. We're also not talking about backbiting and getting, you know, getting back at somebody. You see the difference? We're talking about being a solid Christian who knows who he is in Christ, able to speak to those that might be evil. So he said, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. For you sit to, you know what whitewashed wall is? That refers to a whitewashed, like a sepulcher, like a, like a tomb that was clean on the outside. They clean the outside, but the inside still has decayed bones in it. This is people that look good on the outside, but inside they're just ravenous wolves, like Jesus said. All right. For you sit to judge me according to the law, and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? So now he's going to challenge why he even got struck. 
And those who stood by said, Do you revile God's high priest? He didn't know it was the high priest that did that. And then Paul said, I did not know, brethren, he was the high priest, for it's written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So here he even backpedaled. He even backpedaled off of it saying, oh, didn't mean to talk evil against, you know, somebody in authority. But he certainly didn't just turn the other cheek and just get beat up. And this was even religious persecution. Does that make sense? Even in religious persecution, it doesn't mean you have to get killed. It doesn't mean you have to get beat up. Several times Paul escaped. Jesus escaped several times getting persecuted. Paul got let down the wall. They were after, after him. He got let down the wall and escaped the city. So getting persecuted doesn't mean you just sit there and say, okay, go ahead and persecute me. Get away if you can. Hightail it. Don't get killed. Don't get hurt. If it's a child in school, I would teach my children, uh, don't, don't get bullied. Be, if you have to fight, you fight. Now first, you've got to love them. Then you've got to try to get out of it without fighting. Then you've got to run if you can. And if you can't run, then, then go ahead and defend yourself. But don't get hit. Teach them how to defend themselves, dodge it, whatever you got to do. You know, if it's the last resort, you punch them. <laughs> or if you want to win the, win the fight, punch them first. <laughs> if it is imminent, do what you got to do. <laughs> now, you shouldn't be known in the school as the one who fights. You should be known in the school as the Christian who never wants to fight. Right. See, I mean, there's a, you got to teach... There's a whole lot that goes into teaching children. And sometimes they're too young to understand all the ramifications of everything. But I don't think Jesus is saying, go ahead and get beat up every time somebody wants to hit you. That's right. Right. Make sense? Yes. All right. Is everybody satisfied with that? If you're not satisfied, you can email me and we'll talk about it some more. All right? For today, I think we're going to move on. Can we move on? Or is it time to go to lunch? Oh, I do want to mention this. Remember uh, Peter chopped the ear off? This is Peter chopped the ear off just about ten verses after Jesus said, Okay, now... Get your sword. And if you don't have a sword, go get some money, go buy a sword. Jesus told them to carry swords. Then Peter chops the ear off, and Jesus says, put that, put that up, puts the ear back on. <laughs> says, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. But that's in reference to persecution for righteousness' sake. Jesus is getting arrested for his preaching for who to culminate the entire plan of God. So he said, we're not going to fight against the persecution. You don't fight with swords against the persecution. See the difference? But he didn't say don't carry a sword. It's okay to carry a gun. It's okay to have a gun. Just don't plan on living by it. I got guns. I got a bunch of guns. I don't plan on living by them. But I do know where they are. I know where the bullets are in the house too. And if I had to protect my house for some reason, I could. Does that make sense? Yeah. We don't have to be totally against everything. You have to understand perspective of things. Now, if you don't want a gun in your house, that's fine. And if you do have one, you better, go, you better have some strict rules about it. You better be trained in it. You better know what you're doing with it. You better have the whole thing, the whole family trained and, 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 and guarded, from all that kind of thing. Sure, sure. From a little kid, I, I knew exactly what to do and what not to do. From a little kid, little tiny kid. One of my friends at his house pulled out his gun when his parents weren't home one time, and I, I, I jumped on top of it. I mean, I didn't, not in a dangerous way. But we, I, I said, you put that back up, put that back up. You know, he's, ooh, ooh, look what I got, I found my daddy's gun. Ooh, ooh, ooh. No, no, you can't, your, chil your children have to be trained, it has to be locked, all, all those have to be rules in the house. All right, now that's what the anti-gun people are upset about. Well, let's fix that. But in, in, in normal families, in, in good trained families, it's no problem. But if you don't want to have one, you don't have to have one. Make sense? Yes. Some churches have guns, have their ushers carry guns. How many of y'all would like our ushers to have guns on them? 
I'm not looking. I'm not looking. Some say yes. Some say yes. Some say no. We would have to vote on that. You want to vote on that one? I don't think that's necessary. We, we, we have enough power in here to stop it in the name of Jesus. That's, how, that's our plan. We have a plan. It's not like we don't have a plan. We have a plan. The plan is enough of us know how to say no in the name of Jesus. Put the gun down in the name of Jesus and it will go down. Absolutely, that's our plan. All right. And <laughs> who wants to be the gun toter around here? Don't raise your hands. I, I, I know who you are. <laughs> well, we have to give a little humor on light of some tough subjects, right? So, <clears throat> I guess in summation, uh, there's powers that be that are ordained by God to handle terrorism. Don't you be afraid of it. Terrorism has probably not touched most of you. Maybe some. Probably not touched most of you. You don't need to be concerned about it. Uh, they could... Oh, I don't want to go there. All right. The world is in a tough spot. All right. We're, we're trying to live happily and peacefully in it. That's why the scripture says, pray for those that are in authority that we can lead a quiet and peaceable life in Christ Jesus. So we, we have a right to pray for the authorities so that they can make right decisions Righteous decisions, logical decisions, so we can stay in quiet and peace, so we can spread the gospel in the free way that we're doing it. All right, that's where we stand in it, but in no way are we to be afraid of what's happening in the world. All right, Jesus mentioned that. The scriptures mentioned that several times. Wars and rumors of wars don't have to, he said, let your heart not be troubled. In, in this world, there's going to be troubles and tribulations. Do not let your heart be troubled by any of them. Sure, we hate to see what's happening. Sure, we hate to see innocents die. Sure, we all feel the same way. God feels the same way. Just don't let it get into your heart and take your joy, steal your peace, or worry you. Amen? Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. We trust that your faith and your love for God is stronger than ever before. Chaz and Joni Stevenson have a New Testament vision of spreading the full gospel of Christ around the world, helping unbelievers meet Jesus Christ, and building strong Christians who can impact their world, and are doing so by preaching the uncompromised Word of God with the power of the Holy Spirit. To join us in that vision, please consider an offering to help with media costs, or an offering to simply show the value of the spiritual things you have received. You may give online, by mail, or by phoning in with a credit card. If you're in Houston, Texas, and looking for a good home church, Pastors Chaz and Joni invite you to a spirit-filled, life-changing service at Houston Faith Church, where we're certain you'll experience the love and goodness of God in a real and powerful way. For more information about God, Houston Faith Church, or Stevenson Ministries, please visit us on the web, where you can now watch services via live streaming and find many other life-changing resources, or download our Houston Faith phone app.